Hello and welcome to Legato's short topic training videos. These videos provide a quick look at various Legato features. In this video we'll give a basic overview of dialogues within Legato. We'll examine some dialogue coding. We'll overview how dialogue resources work. And we'll discuss common dialogue events or procedures. We'll begin by just taking a real quick look at how dialogues work. There are basically two types of dialogues within Windows, plain dialogues and then property sheet style dialogues. In each case, the dialogue will have a caption. They'll have a page. With property sheet dialogues, you'll have more than one page. And then you'll have controls on that particular page. Each control on the page is actually a specialized window class, such as a static or an edit control or a combo box. The next style of dialog is the property sheet style dialog. Basically it involves having multiple pages stuck on one property sheet dialog. In this case the caption is actually set by the script and is not part of the dialog page. The dialog page captions become the tabs. The tabs are then arranged and accessed by the user clicking on them. The page looks exactly the same. It has controls just like a single page dialog. And then finally, there are sheet buttons that belong to the entire property sheet. Setting up a property sheet dialog is actually very easy within Legato. You just simply pass an array of resource names and the scripting language will automatically make it into a property sheet. For this overview, we'll be working with a program called Simple Dialog. This is located on our website under Education Legato Scripting Samples. And you can get to that by NobleWorksSoftware.com or NobleWorks.co. Let's go ahead and pull that sample down and then run it within GoFiler. So we'll go to Education, Legato Scripting, Samples. And on the Samples page under Dialog, I have Simple Dialog and LS. Notice there's other ones that you can play with when you move along and become more advanced in dialog programming. And we're going to cheat here by just selecting this entire thing and copying it to the clipboard. I'll then go to GoFiler, make a new script, make sure you make a ls file otherwise it won't run, and we'll paste, and I can run. And you'll notice I have a simple dialog here. It has only a few controls. It has a static text control an edit control, and two buttons. And it gives me a response code, which I have error cancel after I hit cancel. Let's take a look at the insides of this particular program. You'll notice if you look closely at it, it does not have a main entry point, so it's just simply starting as a free-flowing script. There is one independent procedure which runs separate from the free-flowing area of the script. I have a definition here where I define the term my name as 101. That's my control ID. Control IDs must be numeric. I'm using a string to pass my name back and forth, and I have a return code to just let me know what happened after the dialog returned. The dialog call itself consists of the dialog box function, which has two parameters, the name query, and that happens to be the name of our resource, and then query underscore, which is the prefix to our procedures that will become the events for the dialog. The way this is structured, it will open up a single page dialog, not a tab dialog. If I wanted to have a tabbed or property sheet dialog, then my resource names and my procedures names we put into a string array, which would have to be defined and then passed to the function. The second part of this is the actual dialog resource. Now this isn't really code per se, it's actually a resource template that's compiled into Legato and then used by Windows to present the dialog. The resource scripts that Legato uses are exactly the same as the Win32 SDK or the Windows SDK and they're also used by many other applications. There are third-party editors out there to give you a visual editing of the dialog box or other resources. You can use Visual Studio, ResEdit, or you can manually edit them. Frankly, there is not a lot of really good editors out there, so you'll find that you may get the frame of it set up and then manually edit the code to get the desired effects. So then this consists of two basic parts. 
we have the header of the dialog, which is right here, and that has got our name query and declares the dialog. We then have information about the page, and then we have the content of all the controls. Now note that this is wrapped because it won't fit on the screen. You cannot have line breaks inside of each of these lines. They must be one contiguous line, unlike the rest of the structured programming. In this particular case, the resource is embedded in the script. In order for that to happen, I actually have to say scratch mark resource and an end resource. This could also be put into a .rc file as a separate file to be included with the script. The last part of our script is the procedure that validates the content of the dialog, and we'll talk more about procedures in a moment. But basically, this query validate is the name I had as a prefix is query underscore, and then validate is added on by the dialog processor. It then contains the code to do the validation to get the data, and then to return. If everything is okay, we return error none or zero, and it will proceed and exit the dialog, passing the data back. If there's an error, I want to return an error code, a structured error code, and the control ID. And when I return the control ID, that'll set the focus on the particular control that had the offending data within the field. A dialog control is basically a specialized window that performs specific tasks. We'll discuss some of the controls here. It's a very large subject and uh, could cover many training sessions. But basically you have a window that does something like presents a list box and lets you select an item. Windows itself has a number of common controls built in. These are just some of them. Basic edit controls, list boxes and combo boxes, static controls that draw lines or put some text up, check boxes and radio buttons, and then buttons and group boxes. Groups basically allow you to surround and also delineate between different radio control groups where you might select one of five and have uh, two or three different groups of controls like that. There are also many extended controls that Windows has. Legato only supports a few of these controls and we'll be adding more support as time goes on. We also have some custom controls like data control and image preview or page view control that allow you to bring up particular things like a spreadsheet inside of a dialog. Let's dive a little deeper now into dialog resources. Dialog structure and content is described in a dialog resource. Dialog resources follow the Win SDK standard for resources, meaning that there are definitions for common controls, there are definitions for different types of styles and things like that built into Legato. There's two types of control descriptions. One is this type of old school control like L text, and we're not going to cover that here. We process that, it's handled by our compiler, it's created by some of the different resource editors out there. We're going to use the generic control style here. Legato will compile the resources on the fly when the script is run. It's done very quickly and it's just simply held in memory, and then as soon as you invoke a dialog, it pulls that up and passes it to Windows. And these can be located in the ls file or the script file or as a separate file as .rc for resource compiler. As controls are placed into the resource, that essentially becomes the tab order. Now we're going to discuss here again the style of a generic control. Notice that these are multiple lines. Each control must be on its own line and cannot have line breaks in it. It's broken here for visual clarity. So we start each control with a control keyword. We then have a standard control class name, in this case static or edit. If this class name is not correct and is unknown, the dialog will exit with an error, and it's a very generic error. Windows doesn't report the details of that, which is kind of unfortunate. When you have a problem, you're going to have to effectively divide and conquer and figure out which control is causing the problem by removing them and adding them incrementally until you figure out which one's the issue. You then have initial text. For example, with the static control here, enter name. It can also be blank. In some cases, like a list box or a combo box, the initial text is meaningless because it happens to actually be a list. If you put something in there, it doesn't mean anything. My control ID. It can either be a number or a defined number. They must be 16 bits. In other words, they cannot exceed 65, 535. And also, you'll see here we have minus 1 in one case. In that case, minus one basically means it's a generic, unaddressable control. So it'll appear on the dialog. The script will not be able to actually directly access that control. 
It's just something that's to frame something up, and I don't care what it looks like once it gets up there. The next thing we see is window and control styles, like WS Visible. Failure to put WS Visible on means it won't show up. It'll be hidden initially, and that is a child. And then you'll see SS Left. That means it's a static style with a left aligning text. These are listed in the documentation and you need to use the appropriate items with the appropriate controls. In the case down below here, we'll see we've got edit style left, and it has a border, and it also becomes a tab stop. The next group of items is the position and size, and what we're seeing here is the X and Y, and then the width and the depth of the control, and then finally the zeros at the end, denote extended style information. Most controls do not take extended style information. If they do, they're usually things like sunken border and information such as that. In this case, it's just noted as a zero. The controls themselves are put into the dialog resource wrapper. And basically what you've got is the start of a dialog using the dialog control statement. There's also a dialog EX control statement. They are essentially the same for Legato. Some other applications, if you use them as a resource editor, may be more sensitive to that. Then you lead off with the name of the dialog. Don't use quotes, avoid special characters. In some cases, you can use a, a number for this. It kind of, again, depends on what type of resource editor that you're using. We then have the position and size. The position for Legato doesn't really matter, or Go file in general can be zero, zero where it starts. It will not appear in the upper left corner of the screen. This is because dialogues are always either centered or they're left or right, depending on what mode is set up within a script. So the starting position is not relevant. The size on the other side is relevant. If you're doing property sheets, the largest dialog page becomes the size of the entire dialog with the outside frame around it. There are also window and dialog styles. Notice again the visible. It has a caption. It's a pop-up window. The DS or dialog styles that dictate the particular look of the style, and there are extended styles. The caption, I note there's a WS caption that tells it to paint a caption, and this is the caption text. If we're doing a property sheet, this becomes the tab text. And then finally we have the default font. So all the controls will start off as this particular font unless they're changed. So we've now set the framework, but we actually want to have this run. What does the dialog actually do? When I've run the dialog box function, the dialog will have essentially three states. It's going to initialize or load the controls. You're going to have an operational mode, basically when you're clicking on controls and having things happen within the dialog. And then finally you're going to press OK or Next, depends on what type of dialog it is. And you're going to validate the contents of the page and retrieve the data. These states are processed by event procedures. In the documentation, there's approximately two dozen different types of procedures. There's really only three or four of them that you're going to use on a regular basis. In our simple program, we only have validation. We're not actually loading anything, and we're not doing anything on changes in state controls. So we have dialog events that are handled by legato procedures. When I perform the dialog box function, that ends up invoking a Windows message loop, and it will stay in that message loop until the dialog box has been told to exit or some error occurs. The first thing it'll do is run the load. We'll then do control actions. It could be anything from tabbing from control to control, selecting something within a dialog, double clicking on something, hitting a drop down on a combo box, any number of things will cause an action. When you press OK or Next or whatever case it happens to close that particular page, it's going to run the validate. And there are lots and lots of other functions that can be run or procedures that are run. If you do not define a procedure, for example, load is not defined in our simple item, it just simply says, oh, there isn't one, I'm going to do the default action, which is usually nothing. So a short recap, the dialog box function is going to call various procedures as required. Some of the procedures are only called once, such as load. If you don't have a particular procedure defined, the default action is taken. The return value for most procedures doesn't matter. 
It does matter for things like validation, because on the validate, if you return an error, that means don't continue, don't allow the user to leave that dialog. If you have an error in the script that occurs during a dialog procedure, it'll just simply close the dialog and roll out and then give you an error display in the log. We're going to jump in and do a high level on a couple of the procedures here. The most common one is the load procedure. That's called prior to the page actually being displayed. And the script can then load all the controls as required. You might load selections and combo boxes. You could set the initial state of items, take data from your program and put it into the dialog for the user to edit. And you can also set the control that's going to receive keyboard focus or the position where the carrot will flash when the dialog first opens. The next common event is the action procedure. Anytime a dialog control has a notification or some event, it's passed up to the dialog box procedure and then over to your particular procedure. That particular procedure should be defined with two integers, the control ID and the control action. The control ID is obviously the ID of the particular control. For example, within our sample, we have the control ID of 101. That would then be sent as the control that had the event that happened. Control IDs with minus one do not send actions. Each control type will send different types of action codes depending on its style and what type of control it is. For example, a list box will send select or double click events, but it may only send these events if the LBS notify style is set within the style for the control. In addition, almost every control that accepts keyboard input will send a kill focus and set focus message. You must use the particular action codes for that type of control because they're not necessarily the same code from control to control. Looking at the Legato SDK, these are the defines that are included every time you start a Legato script. We can see some of the events. For example, these are the combo box notify events. And you'll see here that select change is 1, kill focus is 4. If I scroll down and look at the edit notifications, kill focus is actually 200 hex, as opposed to what you had in the previous one. Now this is what comes out of Microsoft's SDK, so you need to make sure that you don't get these confused, because if you use the wrong designator on the wrong type of control, you'll get undesirable action, or you may never receive the particular event, or think you've received that particular event do use those with care. So for a list box, their LBN or a list box notification and etc. The key thing to remember here is that actions give the script the opportunity to enable or disable controls, display additional information, or load certain other information. There are some instances you need to be very careful about causing events to happen during an event because you can get yourself into a loop and effectively crash the program. The last common event we'll discuss in this training is the validate event. This will occur when the user presses OK or you have a dialog, post OK, or they hit next on a wizard, anything like that. If we take a look at our earlier example, we're going to have the query validate. There are no parameters. You'll come in and grab your data and then validate each field. If you have an issue with it, return an error. Of course, you're going to want to put up a message box because returning an error without putting a message box up will just look like it didn't do anything, except perhaps change the focus of the control that had the error on it. When everything is OK, just simply return error none or zero. Within property sheets, you'll get a validate for every page that has had activity you do not get a validate for a page that has not been displayed by the user. So as we saw in that example, by returning a formatted error code, such as error soft, and then the control ID, the validation is basically stopped, and the keyboard focus is set on that particular offending control. Returning error none allows the validation process to continue, all pages finish, and then the dialog box function returns. The final topic we'll cover in this particular training is some of the functions that are used within the dialog box arena. Basically, Logato provides a series of general functions to manipulate controls, such as hiding or disabling or enabling or showing a particular control. Each particular control class is then supported by specific functions to that control. For example, for a checkbox, checkbox set state, 
or for a list box, list box add array, or list box insert item. For additional information, take a look at some of the other examples on the samples page. There's a combo box and list box sample that shows how to handle the various types of events from combo boxes and list boxes. Other videos, and of course the Legato reference manual. You can always press F1 on any function and get to the reference manual. For example, on the dialog box itself, F1 up comes that particular function. But that's in the entire area of dialog functions with an overview on how they work. We have our control resources and how the dialog resources work, dialog templates, and then custom dialog discussion. So there's lots of information here to aid you in developing your own dialogs. And good luck and thank you for watching. If you have any questions, go ahead and contact Technical Support. Thank you very much.